What is going on investors? Hopefully guys are doing well out there. That is right. It is Friday. It's time to party. But before we get into all that, we're going to get into the Fang Stock Recap Show where every Friday we recap all the major news of the week from all the major Fang Stocks, including Microsoft and Tesla. And this week we had a surprise earnings results from NVIDIA and we had Elon Musk selling Tesla shares. But we start things off like we always do with Meta Platforms. Start of the week closer to $171 per share. End of the week closer to $180 per share. This is after Meta says that they're testing end-to-end -end encryption on backups in terms of your messages. So you're going to be able to back up your messenger, back up your WhatsApp in an encrypted environment. Whether or not users really care about that or will actually use that or that would be a differentiating feature that will allow them to use messenger could be whether or not people actually trust Meta is probably a bigger question. Not a lot of news out of Meta, which is actually really rare. Moving on to Apple, start of the week at 166, end of the week closer to 172. All of these stocks just rocketing higher. Apple just $10 away from its 52 week high and I am shocked. This is after Apple said that they could raise their Apple iPhone 14 average selling price by as much as 50 15%. That should make your weekend a heck of a lot better if you're an, an Apple investor. When they're talking about raising the price of their number one device by 15%, that should get you excited because look, the Apple iPhone 13 Pro starts at about $1,000. It obviously goes up from there depending on how much memory you have. Analysts believe that the iPhone 14 should be anywhere between $1,000, maybe up as $1,050, probably $1,200, $1,300, $1,400 for that really like big memory type device. I love this. This news if you're Apple and they are going to raise the price, I think they should raise the price. Now, complicating the situation is you have suppliers like Foxconn reporting their earnings this week, those topped estimates, but Foxconn did warn of slowing smartphone demand. And now we got some contradictory reports shortly after that, after Apple reportedly told its suppliers like Foxconn to start cranking up those production lines as the iPhone 14 is expected to be announced just in a couple of weeks, likely in September, maybe as late as October. This happens every year. We get a little bit of speculation as we head into Apple iPhone season. But if it acts like any other iPhone release, it'll be big for the company, to say the least. Now, ESPN is ending a 40-year Big Ten relationship while Apple and Amazon are in the hunt for the streaming rights. We talked about this on our Disney video, and I've got wild, I'm, I'm talking about wild speculation that I'll talk about here in a minute. But this deal was, and I say just, this was just $380 million over seven years. This wasn't one of the giant kind of like two or three billion dollars we're looking at when we're talking about something like the NFL. The fact that Disney, which obviously owns ESPN, is starting to walk away from these is really, really interesting. And obviously we know that will give a huge competitive advantage to Apple, which has the money, which has the cash flow and could even borrow even more money if they wanted to, to gobble up these rights, Amazon to a lesser degree. Here's my wild speculation. I think over the next five years, Disney's going to get rid of ESPN and the buyer will ultimately end up being Apple because there's been rumors over the years where Apple might buy Disney. I don't think Apple has any, absolutely no interest in running theme parks. But when you look at Disney's financials, it's starting to make a lot of sense that that company could eventually separate ESPN from the core holdings of the business. Quite frankly, they could separate the entire media business, the ABCs and all that, but it would make far more sense with ESPN. They walk away from all these very expensive sports contracts. They stop showing live sports because Apple is going to be able to gobble up most of those rights. And obviously you have other competitors like CBS, Fox, and others in there bidding on those. I think over the next four or five years, ESPN is going to be disposed of by Disney. And I think Apple will end up with that. That's just pure wild speculation, but I think it will make sense one day. Apple could announce a mixed reality headset in January with a price tag as high as $2,500. Are they crazy? I'm also here at first time here on the investor channel. If Apple puts out a mixed reality headset and it costs anywhere near $2,500, that is going to be an absolute flop of a device. Yes, it will have its niche market. Yes, the Apple fanboys and fangirls will flock to something like this, but it will not move the needle at Apple. This will be an absolute flop. 
The reason why we know this is the Oculus device, which could end up being better from a software perspective. And from a use case perspective, that device is far, far cheaper than this. And we don't see long lines and long demand. And certainly when we looked at Meta's financials, there wasn't a lot of evidence that the Oculus has a lot of demand at its price point. Apple's device at 2,500, nobody's gonna buy that. Apple has spent roughly just $200 million on deals in two years. This is down from over $1.5 billion in 2020. The reason of this is because of the regulatory approvals and the time it takes to get these deals done. This is both a Democrat and a Republican problem. I have no idea why both parties, but especially the Republican Party, which has ran for decades kind of as the deregulation type party, has all of a sudden got on the regulated bandwagon and started not not allowing M&A to happen. This is causing cash to stockpile over at Apple. This is another reason why they continue to buy back shares because they cannot use that cash in M&A deals. It's also another reason why they're going after these sports contracts because it's just another thing that they can spend their wild amount of cash flow on. If they were able to do M&A deals, I don't think they would be going down that route, but that is the route they have to go down and it's the route that Washington has cornered these companies into both parties. Moving on to Amazon, start of the week at 143. This one just basically sideways, end of the week essentially flat at 143. CVS Health tried to acquire one medical before Amazon eventually did. This is according to regulatory documents that says that one medical received a bid from CVS, which was essentially about equal with Amazon, but one medical decided to go with Amazon because of the regulatory environment. One medical believed that maybe it was going to be difficult to combine with CVS in a timely fashion given the regulatory scrutiny, whereas Amazon, while they have market dominance in other things, not necessarily in medicine or healthcare. Obviously, we saw regulators on Washington, D.C. have pushback on this deal, but it's very unlikely that they'll be able to stop that transaction, especially when the only other bidder is CVS. Amazon expands palm scanning technology to 65 more Whole Foods stores. So apparently you're going to be able to go into a Whole Foods and scam your palm to pay. Whether or not you want Amazon to have that data, that's up for you to decide, but it's probably a pretty quick and effective way to pay for something. Walmart is weighing bundling a major streamer into its membership offering. So Walmart's got this Walmart Plus. Think of it as like a, I think of it as like a poor man's Amazon Prime. So what they're going to do is maybe partner with a Disney Plus or a Netflix or an HBO or one of the other streamers out there to where they get it at a wholesale. So, so T-Mobile is doing this, Verizon, several other companies are doing this as well, where they get a wholesale rate and then they bundle that into either your cell phone service or something like that. Obviously, AT&T tried to do this when they wholly owned Warner Brothers and HBO at one time. They realized really quick, like within a year, that wasn't going to work. So they decided to spin it out. I think what this says is that Amazon's Prime video offering is actually probably pretty competitive. And Walmart's probably done enough research to realize that not having that be a benefit keeps people from subscribing to Walmart Plus. We'll see what happens there. iRobot, which was acquired or agreed to be acquired by Amazon last week for about one-time sales. We talked about it here on the show and analysts are chiming in. Essentially what we talked about last week that you should see pretty massive synergies. That when uh, Anytime you see the word synergies when it comes to an acquisition, what they're meaning is, look, we're going to be able to fire CEOs and middle managers and we're going to be able to cut all these costs because Amazon already has those examples executives. They already have the office space. They already have all the things in place. They're just going to take the pieces from iRobot that they need, some IP, some marketing, the actual products, maybe some manufacturing, and they're going to be able to roll that up into Amazon and basically cut a bunch of costs. We noted iRobot has massive marketing spend. It's fact, it's their number one spend is on marketing. And you better believe a lot of that has gone to Amazon. And so now Amazon is going to get all that marketing costs for basically quote unquote, 
for free. Moving on to Netflix, start of the week, 230. This one rocketed up 8%. You'll see this from a technical perspective. This one's at 250, a very critical level from a technical perspective. If this thing keeps going up, the rest of this market's going to keep going up as well. Now, Disney jumped almost 7% as the park surge and led to an easy third quarter beat. This obviously doesn't necessarily relate closely to Netflix, but we did see Disney earnings, and we talked about how this company's parks division is is absolutely on fire, but what's struggling a little bit is the ESPNs. It's the Disney Network. It's ABC. Those types of things are definitely struggling a little bit from a revenue growth perspective and certainly a profit perspective as well. One thing I did want to note is Disney announced several price hikes for all their streaming platforms. I think that's actually bullish for Netflix considering Disney Plus was priced significantly under Netflix. I think that could be bullish for Netflix as the prices of all these streaming platforms start to be essentially equal. Now, moving on to NVIDIA. Big news out of NVIDIA as this stock started the week at 179 and shockingly, it ended the week higher at $187 per share. That's up over 4.5%. This is after NVIDIA plunged 8% early in the week after pre-announcing very weak Q2 sales. Look, Q2 sales came in at $6.7 billion. Wall Street was expecting about $8.1 billion. That was an Intel-like disappointment. Analysts are lining up and saying we are likely not to see a V-shaped recovery considering the weak consumer demand at NVIDIA. So you have this Ethereum proof of stake. This is kind of taking some demand off of the chips in terms of a crypto mining perspective. Perspective, but you also have a lot of video game demand waning as well as you saw an acceleration of that into 2020. I did want to take a look at revenue estimates and they're starting to come in at NVIDIA. So the upcoming quarter, 6.7 billion. The upcoming quarters, we're expecting negative growth into Q1 of 2024 for NVIDIA. And then somehow, somehow it's going to magically reaccelerate to massive kind of 20% growth in Q2 of next year. We'll see if NVIDIA is able to pull that off. Certainly be here to cover that from that perspective. Moving on to Google, start of the week at 118, top of the range now, up about 2% to $121 per share. This is after the Justice Department said that they could sue Google's ad dominance as soon as September. This is really worrisome to a certain degree. I mean, it's kind of worrisome because this is probably going to take a lot of resources and a fair amount of money to kind of defend this. This will also create kind of a black cloud over Google over that period of time as some investors might not want to invest in this company. But from a sum of the parts perspective, let's just imagine a like the worst case scenario and the justice department says hey google you got to break up your business well that means youtube gets spun out and all of a sudden youtube which is doing more revenue in a year than nvidia is and netflix well what are those companies worth and what do you think youtube would be worth on the open market let alone all the other properties that google has control over i think a sum of the parts google valuation would be worth much more than the multiple that the stock gets in. So this is kind of good news, bad news. We'll certainly be here to cover all of that. Now, Google was ordered to pay a $43 million fine by an Australian regulator after misleading users based on map data and other privacy features that the company were slow to fix. Ultimately, this is what I think happens in this Justice Department thing. You pay a fine, you agree to do some different business structures. I don't necessarily anticipate a breakup of Google, but if that talk starts to get floated around, Google stock actually might respond positively to that type of news. Now, Google Fiber plans a five-state expansion. This is after we haven't even heard about this business in years. They're expanding from 17 metro areas to over 22 over the next couple of years. This obviously is on the heels of AT&T doing a large investment in this as well. These are pretty expensive monthly plans, so Google moving headfirst into that. Moving on to Microsoft, start of the week at 285. This one continues just to go up. It's unbelievable. Up 2.3% to 291, nearly $292 per share. Not a lot of news out of Microsoft. They're keeping quiet. Moving on to Tesla. Start of the week at about 900. End of the week flat, right on that 900 level. But we got a lot of news out of Tesla this week as they said that they sold 28,217 China-made vehicles in July. This was down over 64% sequentially, which is month over month. But there was a reason for that. The fact that companies 
shut down some factory lines in Shanghai in order to upgrade the factory. And I saw pictures on Twitter today of the parking lot outside of Shanghai, and it was the most cars that that analyst had ever counted in that parking lot. So things are back to full speed in the Shanghai manufacturing plant for Tesla. Now, things are buzzing over at Tesla and in general, kind of the EV and even kind of the ESG space after that Senate bill was passed last week. Now, this is going over to the House of Representatives. I wouldn't start patting yourself on the back or started counting your tax credits yet, but this is looking good if you are in the tax credit camp, including Tesla. These are very generous tax credits for new electric vehicles up to 7,500, but also carves out a 4,000 dollar tax credit for used EVs. So boy, you are going to get strong demand for EVs based on these tax credits. Again, this pending approval, pending passage out of the house, pending the president's signature. But these uh, these tax credits are going to, everybody's going to be running to this. You know, anybody that is a net payer of taxes uh, looks for these types of things. And this is a very easy thing. And then when you look at it from a used EV perspective as well, that is going to hold the value of those considering you get a $4,000 tax credit to buy a used car. This is going to be a very bullish for Tesla. Now, Elon Musk backtracked on his stock pledge earlier this year where he said, I'm not going to sell any more Tesla shares. Well, no, he sold $7 billion worth of Tesla this week. This is on the heels of Elon Musk saying that it's important to avoid an emergency sale of Tesla stock in the unlikely event that Twitter forces the deal that he has kind of pending, obviously a court battle there, but also some equity partners might not come through. So Elon Musk thinking he might need a little bit more cash. I think this is bullish for this Twitter deal, probably ending up in the hands of Musk, either at the 5420 uh, price tag that he agreed on or a slightly lower price. I know there's a lot of Tesla shareholders that watch this and the ones that I observe, they're worried about this Twitter thing. Thing. I think this is wonderful for Elon Musk. This basically gives him leverage over every politician, every news outlet, everybody that's a power user of Twitter is basically in his control. And ultimately, I think that's probably a good thing considering this country is built on power and control. And the more power and control you have, the more money you tend to have. And I think that would be beneficial to Tesla shareholders in the long run. Now, Elon Musk buying Twitter now more than likely after he sells another $7 billion worth of Tesla stock. This is according to Webbush. This is obviously what we're thinking. I think this deal with Twitter is going to go down. I don't think it has anything to do with Tesla's performance. We've reviewed Tesla's numbers, their fundamentals, their balance sheet, their cash flows, their operating margins. They check all those boxes. It really doesn't matter how much of the company Elon Musk owns. And if he trades some of that to control one of the biggest media properties here in the United States, I think that's a great trade-off. Elon Musk is tweeting that the Tesla Semi 500 range variant will start shipping this year. And we should see, as we already know, the Cybertruck sometime next year. I don't think, and I might be wrong about this, I don't think a Semi, which has got to cost upwards of like two or three Teslas, right? I mean, these things got to be like a quarter million dollars. I think a normal semi truck, a brand new one is like at least $150,000, $200,000. I got to imagine these are like two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 type things. And if you sell a lot, you don't have to sell a lot of something that costs $250,000 for it to really goose up your revenues. I don't necessarily think that's priced into Tesla. The fact that they could add on a billion, two billion, three billion, four billion dollars on a new product over the next 24 months. I don't think that's priced into the stock, but we'll see. Moving on to the technical segment of the show. We've been waiting for like eight months for the stock market to be doing something completely different. And folks, we are finally here. The stock market has gone on an epic. We're talking about an epic bear market rally. Is this the bottom? Is this the end? Will we just continue to go up and retest the highs? Right now, it looks like it is, but I would say the probability of that is pretty low. But the fact remains, we've been locked in these downward channels for a long time. They are over. They are gone. Now, 
now we're just simply waiting for the markets to start re reaching some kind of resistance. We thought it reached it back here at 4,000. It powered right up there to over 4,200. Now it's pushing up here to 43. The next stop is 44. I mean, it basically goes in $100 increments and you're just kind of holding on for the ride. Eventually you have some kind of resistance, some selling pressures emerge, but considering we've erased essentially the downtrend that we're in, we're going to be much faster, much faster to buy these dips. Now, moving on to Meta. Meta hasn't done anything differently. It is still stuck in this downward channel, making lower lows, lower highs. In the very, very shorter term, it looks a little bit better. We're making somewhat higher lows, somewhat higher highs. We're retesting the highs that we made back towards the end of July at about $180 per share. That's where the stock got rejected. If you like Meta, you get rejected back down to the bottom of this channel. I wouldn't even maybe wait until it gets all the way back down. This is what happens when markets start to make something of a different technical pattern. I don't think you have to be as patient. When this one reverses, I think you can start buying this one again. This is if you believe in the long-term story at Meta. This is if you believe in the turnaround, the Meta all those types of things. Look, you can buy this one south of 170. I got no problem with that. Really on the upside, you should see resistance up here at about 190. If you burst through this, well, I mean, the rest of these stocks are just gonna keep going higher and higher if that's happened. Now, speaking of higher and higher, Apple is on one of the steepest uptrends I've seen in a long time that this stock has made. It was down here at about 130 bucks back in June. And like over 60 days, we have just rocketed up here. Now we're just $10 within the highs. I think you've got to meet some kind of resistance up here. Have a back test to this trend line. Anything, a back test back down south of 160 can be a buying opportunity for Apple. Now, Amazon is just really hanging out in the zone that we've identified. It kind of pushed up into the 140s, 150s. We thought maybe you could get up here into the 150s. It's possible. Amazon continues to rally gets us up into the 150 mark that is potentially possible i'd have to imagine we reach some selling here and then you get a pullback with amazon you get a pullback on amazon there's a gap in price here i would expect that to get filled i'm looking probably south of 130 on amazon would be where i would buy the dip on that one now moving on to netflix this is interesting because we talked about how netflix is actually first of all it's a little more speculative than some of the other stocks in this category especially when you compare it to like a microsoft and an apple which have massive cash flows and dividends and buybacks this company's in a little bit different story so we'd actually expect this one to actually lead the companies to the downside which it did netflix and Meta in particular, but particularly Netflix led the rest of these stocks in terms of its massive declines. Now, what it's also done is it's actually reversed a lot of that very quickly. And we've gone from just really just last month down here at 175. Now we're all the way up here at about 250. Now, this is a critical area that we've had marked out for a while with Netflix. The interesting thing is if the momentum stays with Netflix, there is a gigantic, I mean, I'm talking about like a grand decay canyon type a gap here where from 250 up to 350 i mean it's like a hundred dollar gap on this one if the momentum stays in netflix uh, it's weird saying this but you could cut through from 250 up to at least 300 but maybe even as high as 350 in very short order that's obviously if the momentum stays in this market i am not anticipating that if that happens it would be incredible i would expect a pullback in netflix you get a pullback in netflix on the lower end, back down to probably under $200 per share, probably could be a buying opportunity if you like Netflix. Now, what's really interesting and kind of is supporting the thought that these markets might just keep rallying is the fact that NVIDIA pre-announced earnings that were terrible this week. And obviously, if we start to look forward with NVIDIA, demand for their gaming chips from a gaming perspective and a crypto perspective, both of those look really bad for the next couple of quarters. In fact, analysts already have negative growth priced in for the next year with NVIDIA, but the stock is like up at the highs that it made just last week at $191 per share. Essentially, what NVIDIA is doing is more or less going sideways. And this is what 
I have to expect to happen in the stock market. I could be wrong and I might be wrong waiting for this moment, but I think stocks start setting up more like this where we have these nice rallies, but then they come back. Maybe they don't get all the way back down to the bottom of a sideways consolidation area, but we start to pull back with NVIDIA, anything south of 160. Quite frankly, we've been saying that for three or four months here on the channel. Anything south of 160 has been a buying opportunity with NVIDIA, and obviously that has played true in the shorter term. Moving on to Google, this one's done. Ex so the S&P 500's done some weird stuff. Apple, I would maintain, has kind of done some weird stuff from a technical perspective. Netflix probably doing something weird. Google is doing something just absolutely predictable. Now we're at here at the top of this trading range that we're in. If Google is going to stay in this technical pattern, basically next week, we're either going to hover at 120 and not really push up much above it. Maybe you're able to push up into 123.24. I But anything over 125, and again, this is just 3 or $4 more on Google. Anything over 125, and whew, man, the momentum in these markets is really, really serious. I have to imagine it will run out at some point. You get a pullback in Google, pullback south of 115 can be a buying opportunity for Google. Moving on to Microsoft, also doing something much, much different from a technical perspective. I want to address your attention to the two green lines that we had on here. We noticed since the beginning of the year, the vast majority of price action for Microsoft occurred in there. Now, there was some small deviation to the upside and some small deviation to the downside where the stock maybe spent a week or a couple of days more often than not up or below that price action, but the vast majority of it goes in there. Now, when you see something different happen from a technical perspective, you've completely busted over that for Microsoft. And so look, we can start taking out some of these price actions and some of these technical lines because what is starting to happen potentially with Microsoft is we're starting to go sideways. And I think we're either going to set up here with Microsoft. There's some sideways consolidation between about 280 up to about 311. On the downside, it could be between 250 and 280. You get a pullback south of 280. I think more specifically, right in that 270 region with Microsoft, you get a pullback into here. I think that's your buying opportunity as well. Finally, with Tesla, we talked about for several weeks here on the show, once it broke out of this uh, smaller consolidation area, we thought, yeah, we could push all the way up here to $1,000 per share. Obviously, Elon Musk selling shares could have created a little bit of a pressure on this stock, but it actually is hanging out in an area which were previous highs back in January of 2021. It was also kind of a launching pad in October where once we got over it, we really jumped. There's other areas where we just consolidate right here at almost $900 exactly on Tesla. That's exactly what's happening. If you get a pullback from this area, which I think is possible, pullback south of about 750 on this stock, I think can be bought a rally up into the $1,000 range. This could be an area where you take profits if that's what you want to, to do with Tesla. I tell you what, folks, this is a, just an unbelievable rally. Certainly has extended itself another week or two more than I anticipated. I still would not have fun. FOMO, I still would use my discipline investor hat because folks, still since the beginning of the year, we made highs, we made a lower group of highs. If the market reverses in the coming weeks, even the month ahead, it could just potentially be making another lower set of highs to retest, maybe not all the way back down to the lows, but retest somewhere a little bit lower. I definitely would be more aggressive this time around because when you go on these types of rallies, needless to say, it erases a lot, a lot of technical damage. We'll be back next week to cover the FANG stocks again. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a safe and fun weekend. We'll see you again soon. Good luck with your investments.